Uh, okay, so to the brief discussion, what I might do is just take three questions at a time, and if people could just be conscious to keep uh, questions and contributions rather brief so we can talk to as many people as possible. We'll go three at a time and then come back to Mark. That often just, uh, that often just works smoothly. So you can put your hand up, I'll take your name there. We'll go from there. John, Caroline, and um, Ian. Yeah. Ian, sorry. Uh, so, and actually, Tony's got a row of mic. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask Mark if he thinks that we're at risk of following the same path as Argentina. Um, Argentina was a wealthy country in the late 19th and early 20th century, and I think they mishandled, I don't know, the, I'm not a student of Argentinian history, but uh, they descended into almost the third world. Mark, uh, has the foreign investment board really been asleep at the wheel, particularly in the coal industry? And the second question, I suppose, on the back of that is uh, what have we really achieved for Australia for um, our economic benefit after 112 years of federation? Can you just repeat the first one? Yeah, um, has the foreign investment board been asleep at the wheel? As much as, you know, so much of our coal, you know, good to that, you know, tar more coal owned by. Uh, it's for uh, all Western coal fields, bamboo, etc. Um, okay. Um, thanks, everyone. So, John's one, you know, will be about like, like Argentina. Well, I don't know that much about Argentina, but I guess uh, what I would say is that there's a, a, a phenomenon or that's known as the resource curse, and that applies to countries all over the world that have become too dependent on resources. And because of those phenomena I'm talking about, the dollar, the skill shortage, and all of those kinds of things, you know, the resource industry is crowded out of other sectors, and then, and then when the resource industry, you know, prices drop or they run out of oil or coal or whatever, um, they're left with a very diminished economy, and that's the resource curse. And I think the answer is Australia, to some extent, is going to suffer from the resource and will suffer more from it if we allow this, um, you know, if we if we just give the carte blanche to this huge expansion that's being proposed. Um, to, for Caroline, is GDP uh, counted before the profits go offshore or after? It's counted before. So although those mining profits are counted as GDP, the uh, you know, the check often just never actually reaches Australia. It's counted as GDP, but what happens is the coal buyer in China sends the check to the, um, to the Swiss company that mines the coal in Australia, and the Swiss coal miner uh, sends a smaller check to Australia to pay some wages and, and you know, expenses and stuff like that, um, but it's all counted as GDP. So to be, there's a certain amount of officiality about it. Um, it's <coughs> of our economic well-being. It's a measure of economic activity. So, but it's perceived in the general public as being something a bit different to what it really is. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, yeah. The, has the Foreign Investment Re Review Board been asleep at the wheel? Um, look, uh, I, 
I guess um, I guess the answer really is well, you know, we've got all these resources in Australia. If we um, decide to extract them all at once and sell them in a very short period, and we uh, and it's done by foreign companies who repatriate the profits. Um, you know, if you do it all at once, one thing that happens is you bring the international price down. So Australia is actually helping bring the price of coal down, which means we get less for the coal we get out of the ground because we're doing it all at once. So if you, if you thought, you know, a more sensible way to do it would be to stagger it over a long period and the benefit will last for a long period um, and, and you'll keep higher prices. Uh, you know, OPEC, for instance, um, do that. They limit the amount of outflow of to keep the price up. But we're just doing something that's not in our interest, basically. Um, it's mostly not actually doing it, but I know it's the issue about um, investment and it's um, under what they call the trade partnership. Yeah. And this is actually a move all control of our resources from our sovereignty, our yeah. state sovereignty, to transnational corporations who are controlling the investments around the world. And this is a transnational business.
same point here. Yeah. The, the people in the hallway is the uh, walking track from uh, mothers, 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 people. Um, it goes down to Bullhide, down to the same point. So I thought, well, let's be getting in there for some of our cultural and heritage. Um, customer have a duty to fight against it. Now, every time I go to meetings and all that type of stuff, they're about the uh, money and the dollars and everything you find in them, but I never hear anything about Aboriginal culture and heritage. Um, the effect on it, and like I've said before, and said of uh, various other things, I can't go up there and sit down and contemplate my neighbour. Literally, where my neighbour come from. Um, I was just sort of thought I'd sell this up for bring that to the board. Um, on, you know, look, <laughs> that uh, when I was the news on the uh, Monday after the Sunday, uh, you know, my, my chest, you know, to be a part of this here, you know, my uh, chest of course is digging up in my heart to see what this more put together. I don't know the numbers of the um, position a lot of the people playing in the paddock. But if the ball doesn't seem to hit the ground, it's always moving. Yeah? You know, I'm really proud, really proud of that. You know, it's like we've been, um, you know, this is part of the intervention part that I can see the positive. You know, this part of the intervention. It's like we've been um, re-adopted really and found myself another extended family. Man, two dead are running so beautiful people in here. Thanks, Mark. I've enjoyed very much what you've had to say and learned quite a lot from it. I'm a believer that the GFC demonstrated that uh, open exchange rates are really uh, a damaging economy. Does the Australian Institute do any research on managing the exchange rate? Because that's our economic connection really with the rest of the world. And I think until we can manage that, I don't think the economic impacts are actually the core issue. I think the real impacts are things like what I was talking about, uh, the environmental damage, um, you know, cultural heritage damage, impacts on communities, or water tables, all those kinds of things. Like they're the most important things. They're what our values are generally all about. But I think it helps to understand, because the key argument for the mining industry is that it's an economic, you know, um, boom for everyone. I think we need, it's important that we're able to see that more in perspective and challenge some of those, some of those perceptions, if you like. Uh, the second question about if the EIS and the mining companies are saying that they have all these economic, um, you know, acknowledging the economic impacts, how on earth are they allowed to go ahead? Um, the, I should probably look, that they acknowledge that they, um, they're written by consultants to the companies, right? So they also, what I've done there is pulled out some of the negative economic impacts, but they also highlight, you know, what they claim the positive economic impacts. So for instance, the 
China First Mine, there's one we looked at, the China First Coal Mine, Clive Palmer's thing in the Galilee Basin, and that claims six, creates 6,000 jobs, but it, um, it, it'll destroy 3,000 jobs around the rest of the country, manufacturing, etc. Okay. So the, the 6,000 jobs are mostly construction jobs that will only last a few years. The jobs that it's displacing are largely permanent jobs in tourism and manufacturing. Um, the, also, the estimate of the jobs that it will destroy are, doesn't, it only looks at the effect of the, um, the skills shortage, so driving up labour costs to manufacturers and tourist operators, etc. So it's only that impact. It actually doesn't look at the Australian dollar, Australian dollar impact. So I guess what I'm saying is that you can, you know, the, the economic impact statements argue that there's a net benefit but we would question whether there is a net benefit. And even if there, and, and you know, so they'll compare construction jobs to permanent jobs and, and things like that. So there are arguably benefits, but what we're highlighting is there's also a huge cost. So when that goes before the people who look at the environmental, the, the whole environmental impact statement, that's this big that covers everything from water tables to vegetation loss to health to economics, um, those things tend to get lost. And I think you've got to remember, like in Queensland, no mine has ever been stopped on the basis of an environmental impact statement. Like they do their environmental impact statements and then they go ahead with some conditions attached. And it's pretty similar in New South Wales as well. So, um, yeah, so I guess we're trying to redress the balance there. Um, in terms of the exchange rate, uh, so we have that, we've looked at the impact on other industries of the high exchange rate. So, for instance, we're releasing some research in Brisbane next week, which will actually quantify the amount of farm income that's been lost as a result of the 20 to 30 cent increase in Australian dollars as a result of the resource boom, and it's absolutely stunning. So, the beef industry alone, for instance. Will, is losing well over a billion dollars a year. That's just a headline figure. Well over a billion dollars a year from that increase in the exchange rate. So that's money that farmers aren't getting because the resource boom is driving up the exchange rate. So we look at those impacts. We haven't developed any sort of policy around or, or done any work on whether we should um, not, fight, not have a floating exchange rate, so we, we just have to look at that. I guess we've, we've just looked at what the impact of the current arrangements are. But we're not really about putting out policies that, you know, we think these should be policies. I guess we're saying, um, here's, we're, we're trying to explain what's going on and that others can, so that the public debate is informed, so that ultimately we get better policies. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, folks, we might have to leave it there for the Q&A because we're running a little bit over time. Uh, but since the start, this campaign has really been about informing our community so we're empowered to act based on that information. And today's been a, a huge benefit, I think, to us in the community. We can now go out on our stores, really, really use that information to, 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 to get that even more. So just thanks again. A huge thanks to Mark and Taylor for coming.